I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. It's about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Join movement expert Aaron Alexander as he dives into the minds of the foremost innovative healthcare thinkers on their approach to optimal health and wellness. Align Podcast. Welcome back to Align Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. In today's phenomenal episode, I got to have my one of my hands down best friends in the universe mainly earth specifically uh kyle kingsbury he is a retired ufc ultimate fighter that was redundant um he is the director of human optimization at on it one of my my preferred companies in the world and um yeah just awesome amazing father and role model and tremendous man here on this earth so i'm really grateful to get to bring him to y'all for the second third something like that time uh this conversation gets into some of the deeper scientific research around psychedelic uh usage really interesting stuff i'm also getting into rearing a child in this modern world and a lot of good stuff Hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you so much for tuning in to the website, alignpodcast.com, A-L-I-G-N podcast.com. On there, people have been digging the five-day movement challenge, which is very meaningful to me because we put a lot of work into it. Uh, It's five simple videos, and it will break down the fundies of what y'all need for your daily movement existence. So hope you dig that. Thank you so much to Four Sigmatic for supporting this podcast. Uh, those guys are great. It is a really high quality mushroom tea, mushroom supplement, mushroom blends um, of all the um, therapeutic mushrooms. So cordyceps and reishi and um, all the ones. I, I really like the reishi before bed. I like the cordyceps from a fitness. They got like cocoa and all sorts of good stuff. So if you want to get yourself a little discount on that, and go to foursigmatic.com slash align. F O U R Sigmatic S I G M A T I C dot com slash align. Get yourself 15% off on that stuff. Um, I recommend trying for workout. Do the cordyceps. See how that makes you feel. Uh, Lion's Mane, really good as well in relation to the um, psychedelic stuff. That's Paul Stamets' recipe is Lion's Mane. Um, niacin and microdose of psilocybin. So that's kind of an interesting thing to explore. Um, I think that's, I think we're good. I think that's enough. Um, I hope you devour this conversation. I hope you guys love Kyle. Check him out at Kings Boo on the gram. If you got any questions, comments, tag Kyle or myself at Align Podcast. And uh, I'd love to hear from y'all. All right, here we go. Back to the Shazal with one of my favorites, Kyle Kingsbury. Align podcast. What? We're just going? We're clapped in, son. Fucking wait! I'm on the gram, dude. No, we're actually rolling. You're not going to edit this out. The Kingsville. All right, shit. All right, this is awkward. This is what I've done. Pull that mic up to your face. I'm coming in. Act like you've done this before. Coming in lukewarm. Kyle Kingsbury. Aaron Alexander. Here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna edit all this shit out. I promise. No, no, don't do it. No, this is all right. There we go. <laughs> cross my legs. Yep, we didn't do the pipe. Lotus. We didn't do the pipe, dude. So, Waldorf schools. Yeah, I heard your son recently got accepted. Accepted, accepted into the into Almighty a, Waldorf. What the hell is that? Into a very high tuition private school that starts at four years old and finishes in twelfth grade. What's that all about? Well, a lot of people that I look up to have looked up to a man called Rudolf Steiner who was an Austrian, he wrote hundred and he wrote way more than 100 books, but on 118 different topics or subjects, he's considered by many to be the father of organic and biodynamic farming. He really was on the cutting edge. I mean, this is 100 years ago. Um, but with child development, he understood a lot of critical elements. Number one, children learn at different paces, and children should be allowed to gravitate towards what their interests are. So if you know, at Waldorf, if your kid is really good at math and doesn't like language, they'll only require them to meet the minimum requirements and the things that they're not good at or the things they don't like, and they can flourish and thrive in the things that they're really good at, which is great because in life, we're not supposed to be a jack of all trades. Certainly, it's nice to be well-rounded and balanced, but 
oftentimes you're going to have to choose a major at some point. You're going to go into a certain field at some point. So being able to excel in those things and take college level courses, and you could do that at a public school, but you know, really, uh, you know, they'll fan the flame for that thing that they're they're into and allow them to to really dive into it. Some other things that are really important, I think, at a young age are the disconnect from electronics, which is huge now. But we see that you know there's studies that show kids who have more screen time uh, develop speech more slowly. Huh. And one of the reasons for that is because and it's kind of like with psychedelics, you know, if we're taking in outside streams of information, we're not being creative, we're not being imaginative, we're not using our own mind to generate fun in the moment. And I think that can destroy children's imaginations and also their want and need to learn how to communicate with others. Hmm. So with that, you know, there a lot of their day is play. I mean, they're outside constantly, even even up through high school, Every 20 minutes, they stand up and they toss a beanbag around. They do some type of motor skill to jog the brain and warm them up so they can go back. So and I, I forget the name of the, somebody just mentioned it to me, but that 20 on, 5 off, you know what I'm talking about? Mm-mm. I talk about it in, I think, Power of Habit. Um, I know it's in a lot of those journals. The Productivity Journal talked about it too. Uh-huh. But 20 minutes of work, 5 minutes of some type of movement or break oh yeah right you know so like having that throughout the day and they do this with all the kids at every at every grade but also specifically in the in the pre-k and kindergarten it doesn't matter what time of year it is and we know this from guys like weston a price but cold exposure heat exposure is very good for us so it could be snowing outside and the kids will put on warm clothes and go outside and play it can be 100 plus degrees outside and the kids are going to take their clothes off and go outside and play doesn't matter what the temperature is, they're gonna play outside and they do it every single day, rain or shine. Yeah. Um, so there's many, many things that I've really gravitated towards the more I've looked into it. And really what sold us was uh, my wife and I went on a little parent day that was two and a half hours, no kids allowed, and we got to see firsthand what they do at the school. We even got to sit in on classes. She went to the second grade and I went to a fifth grade class and I was blown the fuck away by the level of knowledge each teacher had. I mean, I remember in college, professors reading out of a book to me and being like, this is what my fucking tuition is paying for, reading word for word out of a book, (laughs) as opposed to a really great teacher who's telling a story with passion, and she knows it inside and out. She's not looking at a single fucking word. It's all up here. She's memorized it. She knows the story well enough to talk and monologue it just off the top of her head, but every kid in that classroom was engaged. Nobody's looking down. Nobody's twiddling their fucking thumbs. Everyone's hooked. And to see that at fifth grade, I mean, I remember what I was doing in fifth grade. It wasn't paying attention to the damn teacher. So there's something to that. Also, I think they keep the same teacher from first grade through 12. So every single year that teacher's with them, they understand uh, how your child learns. They understand how to teach. They understand the content and because each year they have to learn the syllabus and the course content for the year, it's all fresh, it's new, it's exciting for the teacher as well. It's not the same old mundane bullshit. They're gonna go back through what they taught the last 20 years. They're learning something new each year and reteaching that to the kids and uh, you can see there's a clear cut difference, you know? But there's an emphasis on art, on music, on language, a lot of things that we've lost in today's schools that I think are really important for creativity and tapping in a little deeper than just the nuts and bolts of math and science and language. Mm. Feels, I had this moment staying out front on your porch this morning, actually, where it was like raining and I'm like looking out over the field and by your, you know, next to your house. And, do, 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 yeah, I know. I wish there was, my back door. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and had this kind of moment of, of like just introspection of how important it is to have those experiences of like actually feeling rain you know instead of reading about the molecules inside of rain and analyzing the fundamental mechanics of whatever and you have all these extrapolations inside your mind of, but you don't actually fucking know anything yeah <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's uh um I was I've been talking about this the last few days because I'm all narrow by but but 
uh, there's a, a book called The Message. The medium is the massage, and the, it comes from comes from the idea that medium is the message. And the within that, it kind of gets into like how the mediums of information that we in which we convey our messages. It's the medium that actually forms us, you know. And back in the in the day when writing was bego- was was becoming the same way like you know ipads and stuff are pretty new or like oh yeah i remember that like 10 years ago or whatever like there was literally a time where like writing on clay like that was like the new ipad like whoa we're conveying information and passing on it was crazy yeah and during that time socrates actually has this quote um that we will it will people will appear to be omniscient but they will in fact know nothing and that's what we're fucking, I mean, that's what it p- appears to me, Yeah, you know, and I know that I'm guilty of this, even as I'm regurgitating this quote from Socrates, whoever the hell that was, you know, it's like we, we have this superficial layer of stuff that makes us seem like, oh, but so many kids, like we don't, we don't have experience. We just have screen time. Yeah. You know, I wonder how. Yeah. Ted Decker talked about that. Uh, to me, when we were out in Sedona, he wrote uh, Rise of the Mystics and the 49th Mystic, two of my all-time favorite books, But and it's on the true teachings of Christ. But um, what he said is, you know, you could have, you could read about an avocado. You could have all your friends and mentors tell you what an avocado is, and describe it to you, the texture, the taste, what it looks like, the colors. But you don't know an avocado until you fucking eat one. Right, like it's all just on paper, and I think so much of what we learn, and, and this reminds me of what Paul Check would say, like careful with how much you read, because if you're constantly just in that digest more, process yeah. more, learn more, and you're not doing anything that you're learning, then you're the smartest guy in the room who doesn't know shit, because mm-hmm. you can regurgitate information, but you have no wisdom, you have no embodiment of that experience, and so that that becomes a critical factor in in how we learn and really embody what it is we're learning it's through the doing that's it yeah it's kind of like when you get you know your plan goes out the window and you get punched in the face Mm-hmm. you've had that experience yep many times what's, what's that like <laughs> <laughs> do you have uh, significant what's plan B? do you what's have plan C? are there tangible significant moments like the first time that happened where you go in with like your, like specifically with your fight career yeah i mean i think i think one of the 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 good things that I've learned from that, and this just like in psychedelics can be extrapolated back out into everyday life, not just in the fight, but if I get hit in the face in life or if I get hit in the face in a fight, the first thing to do is to create distance so it doesn't happen again, take a deep breath to reset myself, to calm my mind, and then press forward with whatever I need to do going forward. Mm. Not to dwell on that thing like, oh, fuck, man, I got re- hit really hard. And the next one could be a knockout. Not to get caught in that. And also not to stay there and freeze. You know, like I got to pull myself out of the situation far enough to get a break. Then actually resetting myself with the breath and then moving forward hmm. how I should move. So, and you know, this could be any challenge in life. If I get in a sticky situation at work or with my wife, let me pull, give it, create enough distance so I can take a deep breath, take a deep breath, and then move forward with the right intention. Yeah. How does a screen affect Bear? How's, how's your experience with that? Bear's your son. Yeah. he um, Bear is my son. Um, he has, you know, because we, we did that day at Waldorf, we've, we've really gotten rid of screen time. And my, my wife had a download during, Natasha had a download during um, a mushroom ceremony for us to get rid of our TV. And when he was two, I mean, he would just... He would throw a fucking fit if we didn't turn the TV on. You know, yeah. and we wouldn't give in to that. We'd just let him throw a temper tantrum. But it was annoying to say the least that this kid was addicted to TV at that young of an age. And we really weren't watching it other than in the evenings. We'd throw something on to wind down like a Disney movie or something fun and fall asleep. And um, read books, then fall asleep. But, you know, just having that that giant centerpiece in the living room that he would pass by each day while we're playing was a constant distraction for him. So we got rid of the TV. Uh, we just have, we still have an iPad, which we've limited only to travel. So on airplane flights, things like that, when we go back home to California, we'll throw that on for him. That way he's entertained on the flight. And then afterwards, you know, that goes away and he doesn't see it again till the flight home. Um, we'll still watch a Disney movie every now and then at night for wind down time. And certainly if we have friends staying at the house, like yourself, that kind of stuff. And we want to have more adult conversations without, 
you know, him needing our attention, then that can be the babysitter, but you don't want the screen to raise your kid. Do you ever see the movie Scrooge with Bill Murray? Mm -mm, no. Well, he's basically raised by the TV, you know, and that's where, what he be, why he becomes a TV exec and is so hardwired towards television. But, um, you know, so many kids are, you know, we, we outsource who raises them if, if both parents are working and it's not done in, you know, a multi-generational family like it is in other countries or if there's ethnic people in this country that still live that way, oftentimes it's with a nanny or a caretaker or daycare or, or anything else just so both people feel like they have a life and they can both go to work. But um, that's something we really shied away from. The same can be said for electronics. You know, like you, you want a break, so you just throw the electronics on for your kid and that affords you the break, but who's raising your kid at that point? Yeah, it's easy. It's like a probably slippery slope. Yeah. I'm like, wow, that was cool. He's just like sucked into there. There's a book called The Shallows. Have you heard of that one? Mm -mm. <clears throat> it's pretty cool. So it gets it, it just gets into how it kind of relates back to that, like the medium is the message thing and how technology is starting to form our minds. And maybe it's not even a bad thing. Maybe it's just, it just is, you know. Um, but I personally notice a less a lesser attention span because of social media and because of the notifications and the whole fancy 50 cent unnecessary words like garnic effect, like our unnecessary or maybe whatever, our need to finish closed loops. So your Instagram gizmo is literally, it's like a slot machine. It's like ting, ding, ting. It sees that woof, and, you, and it, you, you're drawn to it. So every time you get that little new notification, you, you feel this, this kind of subconscious need to sort that out. Mm -hmm. And then we have this endless line of, of notifications via email, via Facebook, via text messages. So like our whole life can be consumed by this ongoing shallowness, you know, that the, that the, that the shallows gets into. Mm -hmm. And then it starts to train your brain to not be able to go deeper than that. Like, you know, call it, you know, whatever, a few centimeters inside your, 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 your psyche. Yeah. Cause you're just ting, ting, ting. Do you notice that at all with yourself? Uh, I have in the past, I think one of the ways that I'll get out of that is it anything that I can hack flow with. So archery has been incredible for that. Mm -hmm. You can't really think about other things. I mean, bowling even too. Bear loves bowling. So we'll go bowling. I love that alliteration. I, I worked at I worked <laughs> in a bowling alley for a couple of years as a short order chef for old timers when I was growing up. I think I was 16, 17. And, um, Bowling's hella fun, you know? It's it's considered, you know, kind of a redneck sport or whatever, but I mean, it's 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 fucking awesome. And, you know, for Bear, it's a workout. He's throwing a six pound ball that's a six of his body weight down the lane with bumpers on. Yeah. And I'm bowling, but you, you know, in that, you can't think about other things. You have to be mindful of the breath when I start the, the my turn. Mm -hmm. You have to be mindful of the breath when I'm shooting my bow. You know, all those things come into practice and then you can get into that flow state where it is timeless and fuck an hour went by an hour and a half, two hours went by and now my arm's a little tired. So it's time to go home. But I think the more opportunity we have to really dive into something head on and be present with it, the easier it makes to, to kind of combat that really fast paced lifestyle that we're into because of modern technology. Yeah. Bowling's pretty darn meditative when you put it that way. It's, it's, I think it's, it's easy for like the new age kind of, folks that like do meditation and do spiritual stuff and have crystals hanging from their neck and all that to kind of feel like greater than, mm -hmm. you know, meanwhile, like the hillbilly that goes bowling and shoots buck, they might be, you know, actually pound for pound, way more meditative. Yeah. And you they're know? connected to nature, you know, they're connected to the environment. They're connected to conservation. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into these practices yeah. that go far greater than just, quiet mind house hunting still important are you hunting uh are i'll you be just hunting. shooting the bow i'm hunting i'm just shooting the bow right now practicing but i will be hunting in 10 days out on big island that's gonna be your first one it's my first bow hunt oh. yeah i've been hunting with guns i went last year got skunked on an elk hunt in northeastern oregon small town of joseph named after chief joseph and uh when i was a kid i'd go hunting with my uncles and my dad and my granddad yeah but, uh, you know, I wasn't, I was, I've never field dressed an animal. So this is going to be a pretty powerful experience for yeah. me, for sure. 
I have, it's kind of a total shift in subject, but I have this image of you when you had that like huge, um, what do you call when you have like a huge hematoma on your, on your, on your eye? Is <laughs> it called a hematoma? Quasimodo. Yeah. When you're uh, Quasimodo. So that was from, uh, my fight in Nottingham with Jimmy Manoa and he fractured my eyebrow and blew out my left orbital bone for the second time in my fight career. That left orbital blown blew out. Good God. What happened? And what? Yeah. I mean, I got kicked in the face. I thought he was going to kick me in the ribs. He had great Muay Thai. And uh, I, brought my <laughs> arms, Muay Thai. I brought my elbows in <laughs> to block the fucking rib shot. And it went right past my gloves and kicked me square across the fucking eyebrows. I mean, there's no doubt that's where I fractured my eyebrow. Um, <sighs> drilled me in the face, flash KO'd me, you know, just, just brutalized me. And then they ended up stopping the fight in between the second and third round because I couldn't open my eye. And obviously they got to protect the fighter, but... Um, yeah, that, that was, uh, <laughs> there's no doubt I took my damage and I took my lumps in fighting. Yeah. What is that like? When it happens, it doesn't, it really doesn't hurt that bad. I mean, having someone check a kick shin on shin hurts a lot worse. That'll right. hurt in the moment. But even that is dulled compared to what you feel after the fight. And I think, um, you know, I had some general head pressure and things like that, but the, the head injuries, don't hurt uh, that bad. The body injuries hurt worse. You know, separating a rib, <laughs> um, tearing a knee, you know, all those things hurt a lot worse. Well, wow. it's kind of interesting. It's like the things that actually create the most long-term damage create the, the least short-term pain. Mm -hmm. How did that affect you after the fact? And what's your perspective on that experience now? Ex how many years later? Uh, four, four and a half. So like putting your body and your mind and your brain and all that through those experiences, what's your perspective on that now versus your perspective on it 10 years ago going into it? Well, 10 years ago, there wasn't much focus on longevity. I knew, you know, I always had this rule of thumb when I get into fighting that if I became a 500 fighter where, you know, you're, you're batting 50, 50, I'm winning some, I'm losing some, then I'd get out of the sport. And that's at any level, whether that was when I was coming up in the beginning to the middle to the UFC, if I ever fell into that, range of win one lose one win three lose three i'd get out and uh i was four and four going into my last fight and lost so i finished my ufc career four and five and i knew that was it um now obviously i pay a lot more attention to longevity and, and how to heal and i still deal with ticky tack injuries from back from fighting with my knees stiff ankles mobility stuff hips um Probably to a degree still deal with some TBI issues, but really that was a catalyst for me to want to learn more about um, How to heal and how to perform better cognitively and I think that's where the ketogenic diet came in for me uh, lowering systemic inflammation using MCTs uh, Exogenous ketones cold therapy anything that boosts mitochondria is going to help the brain. So temperature extremes distance running uh, a lot of those things became a primary focus post fighting. And I think they've paid dividends because I certainly retain more information now than I did when I was fighting. Yeah. What do you think the emotional drivers for a person to put themselves into modern like warfare, like gladiator, modern day gladiator fair, <laughs> <laughs> fair what's, fair. <laughs> what's, what are the emotional drivers for that? Uh, well, when I started, you know, I, I just <clears throat> wanted to. I wanted to beat the fuck out of people. You know, I had a burning desire to hurt people. And uh, mm. it's kind of like, you know, remember in Fight Club when um, Jared Leto gets the shit beat out of him by Edward Norton? Yeah. And um, Brad Pitt looks at Ed Norton and is like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And he says, I wanted to destroy something beautiful. Yeah. That was where my head was at, getting into it. And slowly that transitioned into, I just want to be the best version of myself. I think as I was able to get the let out and start to work on some of those driving issues and uh, you know, plant medicines being a huge factor in that healing process. I really didn't care to fuck people up. It was just more like, I want to be the best I can possibly be. Yeah. Why do you feel like you wanted to destroy something beautiful? Where do you think that came from? Uh, probably some good, some good anger issues, a lot of unresolved stuff from growing up. And um, it just felt good. You know, it, it, it certainly felt good. You knock someone out. It's like hitting a home run. Uh, times a thousand you know it's one of the greatest feelings on earth uh the adrenaline rush the fact that the fight is over the fact that it's a definitive finish not a decision hmm. um 
Yeah, that's something that, that that can hook people for sure. And I won my first two fights in under 30 seconds. Like I was hooked. There was no doubt. That's something I was going to go and follow until the very end. Yeah. And then was there any kind of like remorse for the damage caused in other fighters? Only there was one fight in particular. I think it was my fourth. I think it was my fourth fight. Uh, I got a new striking coach, Vince Perez Mazzola. Great, still a great friend. I was the best man in his wedding. Um, we had worked a lot on the jab and on straight punches, and just he cleaned up a lot. He was a JKD guy. I learned from Dan Inosanto, one of Bruce Lee's main students, out in Santa Monica. And um, I knocked this guy out at a minute and forty-five, but he stayed out. I mean, I used to get on the cage and beat my chest like a fucking yeah, right. rah rah rah. Look at me, I'm the man. Yeah. And I remember coming back and having my hand raised, and the dude was still out. I guess it was a fucking minute after the fact. He wasn't moving, and I was like, oh, shit. And I don't think he fought again after that, you know? And there's been other times where I kind of ended someone's career, per se. Um, Everyone has to make that choice for themselves. But I would think about that stuff in the moment or, you know, after the fact when I'd see them retire. I was like, damn, I wonder if somebody's going to do that to me one day. People have died in the ring, right? Uh, in, in boxing, yes. And that's because they do a standing eight count where you basically, you're knocked out and they allow you a certain amount of time to recover. Yeah. Um, three knockdown rule, thing like that. So you can get knocked out multiple times and still be allowed to fight. And it's that repetitive damage over time that causes the real issue. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if you get knocked out in a fight in the UFC, you're out. That's the end of the fight. If you get knocked down and it's a, you know, they give the opportunity to finish it on the ground, which you can't do in boxing. So there is no recovery period. Um, but I would say, you know, if you ever watch a fight in, in mixed martial arts and you see somebody get dropped and the guy just lets them get back up, that, that's, that's probably the worst thing that can happen to the guy that's losing the fight because he's allowed to re-engage with a d- dinged up head, you yeah. know, and then that can keep happening who knows how many times. Yeah. So what's the story with, 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 uh, TBIs, traumatic brain injuries and like the effect, cause it, it becomes like an exponential damage once they, once you have damage, then damage becomes much worse. Yeah. And there's a lot, I mean, there's a cascading effect that happens. Um, they now know that damage to the brain can cause hormone reduction. So in men specifically, a loss of growth hormone and testosterone, which is what makes you feel like a man. It's also what helps you recover. Mm. You can lose your sex drive. Depression can happen. Um, mood swings, you know, where if you weren't bipolar before, you can start to have some of those uh, symptoms of bipolar where the highs are high and the lows are really fucking low. Um, I mean, we see it with a lot of NFL guys. They can totally. never quite get back. It doesn't matter how successful they are post NFL. They can never quite feel like they're enjoying life. And so they take their own life and a lot of them shoot themselves in the chest. That's one thing that's crazy Whoa. about that is I forget, I forget who was saying it, but, um, do you remember the name of the guy? Peter Atia posted this the other day. Uh, it was a guy who gave a commencement speech for college. I don't know. It's fucking rad. I'll, f- I'll find it for you. And, yeah, we can put it in the show notes. Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, that guy ended up committing suicide later. But what he said was, he's talking about mindset and, and um, you know, living in your heart rather than your head. But one of the reasons most often people will sh- blow their own brains out is because they can't stand the fucking nonstop monkey mind chattering with negativity. Whoa. So that's the thing they shoot because Whoa. that's the thing they hate, right? Whoa. Whereas a very depressed person with TBI will oftentimes shoot themselves in the chest with a note that says, study my brain. And that's how we see people looking at CTE and seeing like vastly shrunken brains that don't have the same oxygen capacity. Um, They're not working properly anymore. So really it does become, and thankfully we know now that you can regrow new brain cells. You can change neural connectivity and, and with neuroplasticity through things like meditation and temperature extremes and any way we benefit the mitochondria, we benefit the brain because the brain and the heart are the most abundant centers in the body for mitochondria. And that's generally our energy production system. So with that, I think having that emphasis on things that help with performance and longevity will help you cognitively. 
And that's, uh, you know, you know this better than anyone through movement. Like if you're fucking feeling a little bit uh, like you're dragging ass in the afternoon, get up and move a bit. And yeah. all of us, bam, you got some mental energy then. You can jump on a phone call. A lot of people walk and talk. Yeah. Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, all those guys used to walk and teach their philosophy in the courtyard. Yeah. Or they would stand and do it. It's very rare. I don't ever think they sat and taught people at a desk. Yeah, Steve Jobs, same thing. He did yeah. walking meetings. Yeah, Dr. Andy Galpin does walking meetings. Yeah, yeah, I think we do walking meetings. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're we <laughs> getting a walking podcast, what are you doing? <laughs> How many people are cruising around the world that aren't like professional UFC fighters with some degree of lower, lower, lower degree, to use that word twice, um, TBIs? I think there's, I think there's more than we realize, you know, it's, it's a tough thing truly to map. It can happen anywhere. It can happen obviously in football and contact sports, wrestling. Um, but yeah, if you're in a car accident, that's pretty significant. Odds are you have a mild amount of TBI, even if you don't have symptoms of, um, concussion where it's hard to sleep at night and you have mood swings and you cry a lot or any of these things, forgetfulness loss of memory it, no matter if even if you're showing those symptoms or not you could still have mild tbi mm. uh the concussion repair, repair manual by dr dan engel i think is a fantastic book and he yeah. he fucked his brain up from uh basically swan diving off of a pier that was only like five feet deep in mexico i think it was less than that really like three feet i think like it that? was like yeah. three feet something ridiculous yeah so he goes head first crushes uh a lot of his cervical spine and smashes his brain in and spent the last part of his life really fixing that and healing it. Um, thankfully there are so many things that help heal that, you mm -hmm. know, from hyperbaric oxygen to cold therapy to mitochondrial boosters to running. Um, and even plant medicines. Now we're finding that a lot of the science coming out on certain alkaloids and ayahuasca can help with neurogenesis and, and really help the brain function differently. Where do people start determining? Because probably a high percentage of people listening to this be like, I think I probably qualify for like brain fog, or I maybe have mood swings, or I maybe have like, where do people start assessing this? Well, I mean, it's aside from going and getting a CAT scan, like it's, it's really, you need to look through your past and comb it finally to see like where you possibly could have had something like that. But if you're experiencing the thing, or if you want cognitive improvement, which is fucking pretty much everyone. Yeah. Um, there are steps you can take for that. You know, there are steps you can take for uh, optimizing your brain performance from nootropics to sleep enhancers to all that shit. So, I mean, really what it boils down to is um, what's the goal? Not necessarily what's the problem, right? So, like, mm. if you notice you have brain fog, it, it might not be that you have TBI. It might just be that your diet's shit. Or there's something that's problematic that's causing you to bog down with all this blood flow going to your gut, working on this problematic food. Yeah. Or maybe you think you're sleeping well because you're in bed every night for eight hours, but you get yourself an aura ring or a whoop watch and you find you're not sleeping very well. You have very low REM sleep, which contributes to a cognitive function during the day the next day. So um, there's a number of ways you can take a look at that and take a peek, but it really comes down to what your focus is. How about plant medicine? How about it? <laughs> <laughs> You've only mentioned it four times, Kyle. No, yeah, buddy. Well, one of the things I love, and I know I say this a lot for people listening, was that two alkaloids they found in the vine of ayahuasca, harmine and harmaline, will actually create new brain cells. Now, that's fucking fantastic because on the flip side of that coin in the tea is DMT. And DMT is now known as one of the most neuroprotective substances on earth. Mm. It's one of the reasons we think that our body will secrete copious amounts more it's than like, alpha brain way more than alpha brain. <laughs> <laughs> impossible yeah. it's free oh, with man. a line we, code we or whatever only slang dmt <laughs> <laughs> um, dmt free use li a line code linepodcast.com <laughs> a 10 percent off send you DMT. all dmt products <laughs> um but yeah you know like like that that having such neuroprotective capabilities there is an important physiological reason we would secrete that upon a near death experience. And that's also one of the reasons people have such fantastic visions when yeah. they die and come back from the dead. Um, a lot of visions that do with God and, and have to do with heaven and have to do with the afterlife and have to do with seeing things with the new angle, which is something we get from plant medicines. So, mm -hmm. you know, we do create our own DMT. There's no doubt about that. And there's certain activities that we do that create more than others. Um, you don't have to attempt 
the the near death experience to get that. But I think it's just an important. It's a cool thing to understand, you know. And then all tryptamine based substances like LSD, psilocybin, they have a number of neuroprotective properties to them. And I think the more science gets into this, it's it's like cannabis. Like fuck, dude. If you ever talk to uh, somebody in the cannabis industry, they're like, bro, and they'll tell you, maybe they don't say bro. I don't, I don't want to give the industry a bad rap. But they'll likely say bro. Fuck, man. There's so much science coming out on all these different alkaloids and terpenes and all the benefits they have from getting rid of candida and fungus and parasites, even curing fucking toe fungus. I forget. I think it's beta carophylline is, um, is a terpene or an alkaloid in cannabis that you can rub it on your toes and it'll get rid of foot fungus better than any other substance on the planet. Mm. And I'm not sure if that's exactly right. So you got to listen to the episode I did with Dr. Bruce Damer on human optimization hour, but there's a cannabis expert on that show alongside Bruce and he dives deep into the science on cannabis. So it's just a matter of, you know, do if we study these things in nature, we're going to find like mother nature is the pharmacy. Yeah. Like it's got it all dialed in. We're here in a concert with it we're not separated from it and we have receptors for all this stuff in the body yeah it seems like so like paul stamets has a has a pretty popular story at this point that you already know about where he 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 cured you could say um his stutter mm -hmm. through a pretty powerful mushroom experience where he like climbed up into a tree and there was like a lightning sun. storm an and ounce of mushrooms <laughs> an ounce of mushrooms which i don't think it was like penis envy like the you know i don't think it yeah. was it was like that penis envy is like a, a very what's the deal with penis envy it's at least two to three x stronger than any other mushroom and i would say it's probably two x the strongest mushrooms you've ever had three x average mushrooms like b plus or golden so Center. there's a difference from mushroom to mushroom it's not just, just like with mushrooms cannabis. it's yeah. like well those are engineered i think they have to be grown in a lab uh, they're highly susceptible to mold, but you can get your hands on them through the dark web. Not that, not that I'm playing party to that or saying this is how you should go about getting illegal People drugs. can buy mushrooms in the dark web. What's that? You can buy mushrooms in the dark web. You can buy fucking anything on the dark web. What is the dark web? The dark web. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to mushrooms, I promise, which is short. <laughs> just are you familiar we're with talking the Silk about, Road? Do you remember that? Uh, I mean, like the, the place? Not the the time in history that was a Silk Road. Yeah, no, the trade happened. No, I don't. The I don't online don't, Silk Road. No, I don't know a lot of <clears throat> things. So there's an about. awesome one of my favorite Audible books of all time is on the guy who created the Silk Road and the Silk Road 2.0. He was, I, I read it when I first moved here. I listened to it when I first moved here to Austin. He was a guy who grew up in Austin, highly intelligent. I think he went to Princeton or some Ivy League school, and then he ended up moving to the Bay Area. San Francisco. So like I knew the landmarks because I grew up in the Bay Area and it just moved to Austin. But his story is fascinating. And back in the day, I'm not sure if this passes the statutes of limitation, but back in the day, I had ordered some shit off the Silk Road. <laughs> <laughs> and this is before it got shut down. And uh, it's a fucking fascinating story of how this guy gets caught. It's not a spoiler alert, but I mean, it's dope because it takes kind of like with Al Capone, every facet of our intelligence from FBI to CIA to IRS to fucking land this guy, Homeland Security, everything. Wow. And, um, you know, you can see kind of how it spirals out of control, but you could buy anything on this site. You could buy fucking organs like kidneys Damn. and livers. You could um, buy hitmen to assassinate somebody. You could buy weapons. You could buy anything. You could buy fucking hand grenades if you wanted by the end of it. So... Um, I like that that was the surprising one. That's the most extreme one. libertarian viewpoint possible. You know, like, like I think that's pretty, it's, it's borderline anarchist. Um, even though the guy's libertarian and I subscribe to a lot of libertarian views, it, you for sure can see like that slippery slope, just like with anything, you know? And, um, but it's, it's fucking rad. It's a great book. Anyways, uh, there are ways you can go about ordering stuff online through what would be called the dark web, uh, using stuff like mTOR, things like that. And I don't want to dive too much into this because I don't want to sound like an expert. I'm not an expert. Yeah. Um, and I haven't done this in many years. So if, if uh, any law enforcement Whatever the statute of limitations is, <laughs> that's when the last, last time you did it. the last time I did it. Like, <laughs> Whatever uh, that number internet is. internet wasn't around 20 years ago. <laughs> I was like, well, fuck. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I mean, point is, you know, there when that place went down, fucking hundreds blew up. It's just like you take out a Colombian drug lord and a bunch are going to step in to fill his place. And that's, you know, that's with anything in life. People who want stuff are going to find a way to get it. And so you have places like this and oftentimes you'll order with Bitcoin or Dogecoin or some type of Bitcoin um, 
currency and then you you cryptocurrency rather and then with that you know they have shuffling devices and ways that they can scramble the money so it's hard to trace where it comes from and you can order stuff online direct to your door yeah that's how it was going down so with that stamp at start as i mentioned that it feels as though our bodies have some deep intelligence and has a basic sense of how to perhaps heal everything i don't know um, but in something like that, it's like how Stamets, for example, could have gone through his whole entire life with this stutter, perhaps only getting worse and worse, you know, and he's doing all the different things and the tools and the tactics. And it's almost like they're just like band-aids mm-hmm. and they're putting a layer on top of the thing. Whereas all of a sudden this like go on top of a tree with a lightning storm with some mushrooms and boom, you know, you're out of the way of yourself enough that that deeper intelligence can come through and start to sort it out. It feels to me like that is maybe it. Yeah, that's been my experience for sure. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, going back to Rudolf Steiner, he had a term for that. I think it's called anthroposophic medicine Damn. or anthropomorphic Kyle. medicine. But it is the idea that the body has an innate ability to heal itself if we get out of the way and lead to a positive environment. You know, if we're in nature, we're not disconnected. We put good things in our body um, and good things in our thoughts, good things in our mind good things in our heart, soul feeding stuff, you know, not soul food, but like soul feeding activities, Mm. we really can see deep healing happen. And there's an awesome documentary on Netflix right now called Heal. Uh, Dr. Joe Spence is in it. Michael Bernard Beckwith. We're going to have the, I don't remember her name, but I'm in email with the person that that created it. We're going to have her on the the podcast. I want her. You're going to give her. I will pass her next. This sounds incredibly (laughs) vulgar the way that we're describing this podcast experience. Uh, It's a dope (laughs) fucking documentary, but they, they list several people who battled stage four cancer and many different ailments. And it was only when they unpacked trauma that they were able to really heal their Mm. bodies and meditation is one of the common threads that helps people to to tap into source and heal their bodies through whatever issue they're going through you know but it is unpacking that thing and you know you've had gabra mate on and you're gonna pass him over to me next but uh (laughs) yeah you know mate one of my favorite quotes from him who's who's a psychologist and a therapist and and a fellow psychonaut who's done hundreds of ceremonies with ayahuasca is that at the root of all addiction is trauma and if you really think about that addiction can be anything it's it's tv it's shopping it's gambling it's you fucking name it it's social media you know it's whatever the thing is that's a distraction if you have a real issue with that there you're likely trying to cover some shit up inside by distracting yourself with something else that could be a drug. Yeah. It could be anything that gives you a certain feeling, but keeps you from having to sit within your own skin. And I think if we really do the work to unpack that, that's when we start to have a deeper sense of connection to those around us, a deeper fulfillment and enjoyment in life. And we could just get more out of every day. Yeah. So we had an experience in uh, Arizona together mm-hmm. and uh, it was, yeah, with, it was with, it was with the, the penis envy. Mm-hmm. Am I allowed to talk about these things? Sure. That's like a normal thing to talk sure. about, right? Yeah. Wouldn't say the location, but yeah. Yeah, right. Um, and so one of the things that I found really fascinating about that was it felt as though at one point it was almost like there was something, I don't know how to describe what it was, but it was like it was like filling every crevice inside of my brain, like all the way into the back and all the way. And it was like almost like uncomfortable, but like good. It was like, okay, this is, it felt like it was turning aspects of my brain on that hadn't been on or something like that. I don't know how to describe exactly. I wasn't hooked up to any kind of, you know, device to see what, but it felt literally like it was just like seeping through the cracks and, and I would, ju- I just, I just wonder what the heck experiences I mean, if like, as you're describing like healing brain trauma and helping with, you know, mitochondria and helping with all these things. I wonder, I wonder what the heck is going on with this. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there is some science on, on energy centers as they've studied on psychedelics. I think at John Johns Hopkins, there is a center in the brain that controls how we categorize things, how we file things. And it's really responsible for our prejudices and this not prejudice in a bad way, but just how we view the world because the brain takes so much fucking energy. Anytime we do something brand new, it's working at a very high rate. But if we've done it enough times, it becomes second nature because we have this filing system where we can say, 
oh, that's this thing, and we store it away in this compartment, and we know which functions to use and which highways to take to navigate that road. That center gets dumbed down, and what happens is we have this expansive interconnectivity within the brain, and we're also truly experiencing things for the first time in that because we've dumbed down that center it's like being a child again and there's so many experiences we have on psychedelics where you feel like a fucking little kid yeah you know i mean i was doing mushrooms with aubrey and we looked at her he was looking at his hands like he was four years old like wow i have hands and i have countless experiences on ayahuasca doing that where i was just like fuck i have a body yeah this is amazing it's a big deal it is a big deal (laughs) and it sounds you know it sounds silly but like you think of things like gratitude and and appreciation for the gifts that you have to experience that in a palpable way i mean it's it's unforgettable it's insane to not look at the world from a child's perspective you know to just to look at everything is like the fact that we have this body and like your dad and mom came together and at one point you were a sperm and then you were living in your mom's fallopian tubes probably for a few days and sucking on the mucus like it's disgusting but that's what happens i'm reading a book about it you know (laughs) (laughs) you know like that's you Mm-hmm. You know, like that's literally you, and we're like, oh yeah, like I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm an investment banker. You know, I drive a Tesla. Like you, you, we become comfortable with like this is who I am. Yeah. But the reality is to become just to just take that for granted. Just this is it. This is it. It's completely insane. You know, to not look at this world as though it is it is a miracle. Well, I don't want to get too like into, but I mean that I, I agree with that. Um, but I just, I think those moments, like, what do you, what's the value of those moments for you? I mean, the, the child the, moments, the beauty of that is that it stretches, you know, it's not just in the experience, however long that is six hours, eight hours, it lasts for months. So it's not like, I, I don't need to go back to the wishing well on a heroic dose of penis envy or an ayahuasca retreat very often because it'll last me a long time. And as I go through life after that, it kind of quiets the noise of Mm. everyday bullshit. You know, like it's Mm. much easier to not sweat the small stuff and much easier to appreciate everything that I have. So, you know, where's the balance? People talk about that. Like if you're going to follow this, this Buddhist idea of releasing all desires, then what about my goals? What about my dreams? What about the thing that I'm driving towards? It's okay to have all that, but to be able to let go of that, and surrender to what is and have contentment with everything that you have right now, that's what gives you gratitude. That's what allows you to appreciate all that is. And then as things come up for you, as you work towards those things that you care about, you're not attached to the outcome. You simply can appreciate it as you go. And that's it. It's not, you know, you see this with people who win, um, you know, an Olympic gold medal and they're like, well, fucking what now? That was my lifelong dream. Now that I've done it, yeah. do I go back? What do I do now? And they can oftentimes get depressed because they don't know the next thing. But the truth is it's all in the process. It, it is the journey, right? And so having a greater understanding of what that means and a greater appreciation for it, it does it does change the way you look at the view, the view your view of the world and quality of life for sure. Are there any ways to look through this kind of psychedelic lens without actually jumping off the the cliff and taking the heroic dose yeah you can microdose no (laughs) (laughs) or that but that no that's that's a part what the heck is that but also beyond that i think i think without without going down um drug use you can which obviously that needs to be cleared up of what drug is i think most people listening to this by now i'm probably ranted about that already but yeah um there is a clear should be a clear differentiation between Good drugs and bad drugs. Good drugs and bad drugs. Yeah. What's a good drug and what's a bad drug? Shh, well, briefly. The, my, my analysis of this is anything that leaves me more whole than when I started is a good drug. Mm. So, and anything that doesn't fit in that is a bad drug. So if I do coke and I'm up all night and I feel like shit the next day because I didn't sleep, that's a bad drug. Mm. If I do LSD or psilocybin and feel great, go to bed, wake up the next day and I have this lingering sense of well-being, that's a fucking good drug. That's a really good drug. Even the harder ones, you know, like Iboga can be incredibly difficult, gut-wrenching for 24 to 36 hours, incredibly nauseating. But the lasting peace that comes after that and healing that comes from that purge and really getting put through the ringer, I know I'm more whole for having done 
that activity than when I started. Is there any research that's showing any kind of long-term deleterious effects? No, what they're finding with long-term research, and I think Amber Lyon talked about this years ago on Rogan's, is that when they went to the Amazon and studied Shipibo shaman that had been working with ayahuasca you know, since age five or 10 years old, they had far more serotonin receptors in the brain. Mm. So that happy neurochemical that we all talk about, which isn't the only thing that makes us happy. Obviously, dopamine's a pleasure neurochemical, and there's a myriad of other ways that the body works is we're not systemic. Um, with that, they found like this, these plants create more receptors in the brain. That's why a good shaman can have one cup and he's there or, or she's there. Just need three or four cups because a little goes a long way now that they have all these receptors in the brain. And if you're to look at it from that standpoint, if it's that natural substance, our body wants more of it. And our brain is showing that over the course of time, it will create more receptors to take that in. Hmm as opposed to Coke or um, smoking cigarettes, things like that, you'll actually start to delete receptors because the body doesn't want to be flooded with that bullshit. So AKA actually, the, the legal stuff, you mean? Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff we're allowed to buy, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like, uh, your body will actually try to counter that by getting rid of receptors, and that's why you need more. I mean, yeah. even with caffeine, which is a natural substance, you'll find your body needs more over time if you don't take breaks from it. Alcohol. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. Um, so where are you, where's your stand with psychedelic usage presently? Cause I, something I wonder about and something I think is, it would be a common reasonable question. Is it something that one, um, it's wise to continue using repeatedly? Should one think maybe like every three months should one think like, cool, I did it. I cured the, the stutter. I'm good. Like, how, what's the approach with that? Well, I mean, first you have to have a calling, and they talk about that, you know, with, with ayahuasca or anything that's really going off the deep end. You have to be drawn to it. There has to be some reason for that. That way it's not just, yeah, hey, I've, I've always wanted to try it. I, you know, I'm interested in seeing what comes up for me. It's, it's more dialed in than that, you know, an intention to heal something from your past or clarity on a big life decision you have coming up. Um, I've got a lot of great information personally in my experiences when I was at a crossroads in my life and I went to plant medicines for the answers. Hmm. And um, I think so, so really having a reason why is important when you're gonna do the, the heroic dose. Um, fuck, what were you asking though? What's, What's the, the long-term oh, yeah, plan? Yeah, long -term. I, mean, I mean, really what Dennis McKenna said about it makes the most sense to me. He's done hundreds of ayahuasca ceremonies and he said he'll continue to do it as long as he keeps learning new stuff. Yeah. And so if there's more to learn, which there always is, then keep going. There always is. Every experience is different. It's like but, the idea of like reading a book. You know, if you yeah. read a book when you're 10, it's way different than when you're, when you're 20 and then when you're 40, than when you're 80. Yeah. And yeah. the thing is you'll only continue to get new information if you're doing the work. You know, if you're actually stuff. reading books, yeah. <laughs> you're actually but, if living it's not, your life. but it's like what Chuck was saying about reading the book. If you actually embody that, that's what becomes wisdom, right? Yeah. So if, if ayahuasca tells me, to do yoga and meditate every day and I don't yeah. and I go back, I get the same fucking message to do yoga and to meditate. That happened to me three ceremonies in a row yeah. across three months. And I was like, what the fuck? I heard you give me new information. And ayahuasca was basically saying, you're not going to get any new information. Would it ever you give you a, a bitch slap? And like, dude, yeah, you're here like, again. There's harder experiences. Yeah, <laughs> you haven't done the work. You're not doing like, homework. I mean, <laughs> Uh, I is funny because it can be extremely gentle or it can be pretty harsh, you know, and I've had experiences where they were both at different times, um, you know, and really understanding what the gamut of possibility is allows you to have a bit more acceptance when it comes up, right? You know, like if you do the experience thinking you're just going to get high and have a good time and then shit hits the fan, obviously you're not prepared for that. It can be a lot harder to deal with than if you know the full range, the full yeah. scope. So, um, you know, having a little research, having a little background on what, what's possible, having a great guide or shaman that can lead you through it. Yeah. All those things are important. When people go through hard experiences, psychedelic or not, but I think it's, it, we're, it's all your psyche regardless. Um, how does one navigate difficult psychic moments 
from a psychedelic experience, but I think it relates yeah, to both. I think I think in both in both experiences there you know there's parallels in all this stuff yep. from uh, everyday life to psychedelics to even being in a fight. You know, like you have an ability to control the way you feel and shift your state. And the guys at Art of Breath talk about this, but through breath work, I can control the way that I feel. I can drop from fight or flight into rest and digest into parasympathetic and really that just becomes paying attention to my breath, being mindful of my exhale, slowing things down. Mm. And if I'm in a rough spot in psychedelics and I remember to focus on my breath, I can generally release that thing and let go of it. I don't have to hold on to the, the fear response or reliving a past trauma. I can let go of it through the breath and mm. let it move through me. Same thing goes, you get cut off in traffic or you're getting yelled at from your wife. You can fucking butt heads like rams, or you can return to the breath, slow it down, remain calm in the pocket, and then go forward appropriately. Yeah. So I think those are, you know, the breath work is just, it's critical. Also being comfortable in your own skin is critical. So mm. being good in silence, learning how to meditate or how to quiet your mind in yoga pays dividends in psychedelics because you know how to quiet that mind down, that, that monkey mind that just wants to race and chatter and think of all the possibilities. And if you can step back and slow that down or just be the observer, as Eckhart Tolle talks about, if you're the observer of your thoughts, the awareness that sees these things, you can gravitate and choose, gravitate towards or choose whichever thoughts you want to engage with. You're not a party to it. You're not along for the ride, right? And there's a huge difference in living in that way and that by no means have I fucking mastered this. I'm still working on it. But, um, you know, having that ability to choose what I'll go down the rabbit hole with versus uh, letting things move through me, it really makes a big difference. Hmm. What about sounds? Incredible. Sounds are incredible. Uh, <laughs> there's no doubt. I mean, music music changes the way we feel. Um, binaural beats can change the way we think and operate. They can drop us into meditation from alpha to theta waves and, and various forms. Like They all work for the most part. Um, and of course, like if you've ever had a live singing bowl played for you, like yeah. there's a vibration that has a palpable feel to it. And if you do that on psychedelics, I mean, it's just fucking magnified. And you can remember that, which is an interesting thing. That's yeah. what I was on Aubrey's podcast. I think a few days ago we were talking about that, like using psychedelics. Like I, I end up playing the, the kind of like the pessimistic naysayer with the psychedelic stuff, just because within the worlds that I occupy there, you know, people are like super pro, even though I'm super pro psychedelics, but I like to come from the outside of like this and that. You, you like know, to play devil's advocate. I just like to, in though. general, you could say almost <laughs> anything. And I'm like, well, yeah. Um, so I apologize in advance for that. But, um, but that was one of the things that, that he said that I'm, I am fully on board with is like using psychedelics or, you know, plant medicine. And I'm, I'm aware of time. Um, you have to be out of here at 1130. So we got yeah, like we got two and a half minutes. minutes. Yep. All right. Um, but using that as to open the gate so you can actually see what the heck's behind there. So you have some type of compass or navigation, you know, and I think that that's something that's like when you do make that connection with the singing bowl, with the, you know, your breath, with the meditation, and you have that, whoa, you got opened wide through that experience forevermore after that, you're like, Okay. Yeah, you have a I general see, I see bridge that. of how to navigate your way back to the thing, to that quiet mind, to peace, to spaciousness. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any any anchor points navigating back to that point? Well, breath, music. Certainly, if I'm playing uh, Parangi, you know, the ayahuasca album or something like that on a playlist during ceremony nights, it'll bring me back to that. Icaros that I'm familiar with when I go to the Amazon will bring yeah. me back, like instantly lock me in. I mean, I've had certain songs a shaman will sing that just dropped me in instantaneously. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's, there's, there's various ways. Like when we were in, when we were in Peru doing Wachuma with Don Howard at one of his last ceremonies, we had a lot of boat rides and he said, bring music. So I played Scott nice, which is, is not quite spiritual? It's a little bit more dancey, but it is definitely tuned in. There's animal sounds and, um, it's pretty chill. But forever now, when I listen to Scott Nice's albums, it pulls me back into that feeling of Wachuma, which is a feeling of love. It's like nature's MDMA. Yeah. So there are ways we can we can really lock in 
our experiences through sound and music and then tapping back into that that's that's a part of the medicine yeah as we're talking i'm realizing this is the last thing i'll say before we're wrapping up i'm realizing that the the upcoming book that i'm doing that's still not out for a while so you know i don't know actually maybe i don't know when this podcast will come out but it's essentially like could be perceived as like a psychedelic movement user's guide in a sense because it is sound it is touch it is breath it is mindfulness you know it's all those things that you that that we can do in this in this plane they feed back into that experience you know i i I appreciate you being able to being able to break all that stuff down for you man Fuck yeah, brother. Thanks for having me. It's dope. What's, uh, well, A, people can jump over to the optimi- Optimization Hour. Human Optimization Hour. Human podcast. Optimization Hour. And listen to Aaron Alexander. And we break show. down all that all that randomness. And then uh, what's the best place to people go from here? At Kingsboo on Instagram and Twitter. I'm not on Facebook, but hit me up. You got any questions, I'm happy to rattle off books for you to read, advice, all that good shit. Dope. Cool. Over and out. <laughs> Thank you all so much for tuning into that conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I am super excited to present to you guys the Align Method online program, which focuses on unwinding some of the deleterious effects of essentially staring into technology. So forward head posture, rolled forward shoulders, and just general collapsy postural patterns. And also gets into a movement guide and how to integrate better movement into your life. Uh, so you can check that out at alignpodcast.com slash align method, A L I G N podcast.com slash align method, or you can find it at the Instagram page, align podcast in the bio. Thank you to the folks that have grabbed the align band, heavy duty resistance band with a door anchor and a free video guide that goes with it. So you can actually just access the free video guide if you want, uh, just to get resistance band exercise in general. It's at alignband.com, A L I G N band dot com. All right. Thanks guys so much for tuning in. Appreciate you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Pow.